Thank you, Kathy, for that beautiful prelude, and welcome to all of you who are taking time this morning with us to worship, to praise our God. We're so glad that you're here as we wrap up our message series called 30 Days, a series about what we would do if for 30 days we could live life exactly the way we thought we should live it. My name is Pam Dubo. I serve as the executive pastor here at St. Paul, and I'm so glad to be joining you here this morning. I have missed you, and like you, I have been worshiping online. And I know that at times that can be a little bit challenging. So throw yourself into this time. Imagine yourself with all of your brothers and sisters, which you really are spiritually. This morning, we'd like to know that you're here and that you're joining us. So we also ask that you take a moment to fill out a Connect card. You can find it on our webpage, on our app, and on this uh, live stream. You can also let us know you're here through your comments. We know that this time um, is very isolating, and one way for us to connect together is for you to send your Connect cards in with information about your prayer requests, needs that you might have, and other things that will let us know how you're doing. But you can also connect with each other during worship by making a few comments on the chat, on live stream, and um, on the Facebook page, because other people see names of those they know, and it helps all of us realize that we really are in this together and that we are worshiping together. I also would like to uh, take a moment to give a little time to Miss Katie, our Director of Children's Ministry. She has some information for our kids and their parents about some things that are going to take place in the month of June for families and children. Miss Katie, it's all yours. Hey guys. hey guys, happy Sunday. You know, it's June, which means it's time for a brand new series. For elementary school, we're going to be learning about faith, believing what we can't see because of what we can. We're going to learn to focus and to grow closer to Jesus through this process. For our preschoolers, we're going to follow along with Ollie and we're going to learn that Jesus is our friend forever. That's going to be the basic truth. That even though we can't be together, friends, Jesus never leaves our side. I wanted to take a minute to invite you this Sunday at 5 p.m. to our summer celebration Zoom call. We're going to have some pretty special guests. It's our camp counselors. They're going to come worship with us. We're going to play games and just get to talk to you because we miss you. I wanted to leave you with this one last thing. God made you. He designed you and loves exactly who you are. And St. Paul, we love you too. We are so happy that you are a part of our family. And we hope to see you soon. Bye, guys. Amen. Our first hymn this morning, number 545, the church, church is one foundation. Let's sing verses 1, 2, and 3. The church has one foundation, Jesus Christ the Lord. Jesus no creation, by water and the word. From hand came and saw the Oh, 
our second hymn this morning, number 623. Here, O oh my Lord, I see thee face to face. Let's sing verses 1, 2, and 3. continue to worship this morning by saying the Apostles Creed together, I invite you to stand. I know that that can feel kind of awkward at home because you're standing there thinking, nobody sees me, what's the point of this? But God sees you standing to honor God as you profess the things you believe and you're doing it along with your other brothers and sisters who join you. So please join me with the Apostles Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and of the life everlasting. Amen. And if you were standing now, you can sit down again. As we turn to a time of prayer this morning, I need to ask you to please lift in prayer the loved ones, the families, and the friends of a brother and a sister in Christ who went home to be with the Lord this week. First, uh, Gil Simonetti went home earlier this week, and just this morning, our sister Rosemary Potter passed into God's loving arms. So please keep them and their families in prayer, as well as all those who are struggling especially hard during these days because they've lost loved ones at a time of isolation and don't know quite how to properly remember or memorialize those they love. We'll keep you informed as upcoming uh, memorial, ser memorial services are scheduled. And now, please join me in prayer. God of us all, God of every one of us who struggles, who strives, who fails, who is forgiven. Every one of us who wonder, 
when life will ever become somewhat normal again. We ask that you look down upon us with your mercy and your favor. We ask that you look down upon those who are sick with a special gaze that is both comforting, that you let them know that they are not alone, that you are present with them. God, we pray for every person around the world today who lives in need, who lives in fear, who lives an unseen life because most people in the world simply won't see them. We pray today for peace across our land, but peace that comes with justice. We pray for an acknowledgement that all is not well and that as your people, the people of the church, we need to draw together to acknowledge what is wrong, to celebrate the things that are right, and to be resolved to make change in a world that is broken almost beyond description. We pray for people of every color, of every ethnicity. We pray that we will begin to see one another in different ways through the loving eyes of Jesus Christ. And we ask that you hear the prayer, prayer that he taught us when he taught all of us to pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. As we continue worshiping by coming to a time of offering, we want to thank all of you who have been so amazingly faithful for the last three months in giving your gifts and your tithes to St. Paul. It enables us to deliver worship this way, to do other things in our community, to continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, so thank you. You can give online through our app on our website. Many of you have been mailing in checks or sending checks from your bank, and we're ever, ever so grateful. But I also want those of you who are just joining us as visitors today, perhaps your church is not able to do live stream style worship, we thank you for joining us, and we have no expectation at all that you will give to the ministries of St. Paul, but we hope that you will continue to give faithfully to your church. And now, as we have a time of reflection and we are thankful for these offerings that are being given, we're going to listen to an anthem that was recorded by our choir, Standing on the Promises. This is brought to you from last October. <laughs> Yeah. 
God, we ask your blessings upon all the gifts that are being sent to your church here at St. Paul. Guide us to the best stewardship possible of these gifts as we continue to bring your light, your life, your word, and your love into our community and around the world. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our third hymn this morning, number 64, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Let's sing verses 1 and 2.
is the garment of our courage The power to make the peace we long to know Let's pause for a moment to pray. God, I ask this morning that your people hear from you, not from me. That they hear your word through me so that the day will come that we will not have any enemies to look upon. That we will look upon every person as a brother or a sister. May the words of my mouth honor you. May the meditations of our hearts be humble and forgiving and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this Sunday is the last Sunday of our message series, 30 Days. We've heard Pastor Bob teach about the importance of living life passionately, about offering forgiveness as an act of real love for other people, and about the importance of humility, of being humble, something that we need a lot of today. Today we finish with the idea of leaving boldly. Now nobody wants to talk about leaving because we're talking about leaving in the most permanent sense, the sense of leaving this earth for our eternal home with God. And very often when the subject comes up, people say, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to talk about that. I'm, I'm not ready to talk about that yet because leaving is tough to ponder. But as a pastor, I can tell you there is nothing more heart-wrenching than sitting at the bedside of someone who is about to leave and to listen to them recount the regrets they have, the things they wish they had done differently so their life story would leave a different legacy. And so today, we're going to take a little bit of time to talk about the legacies that we live as individual believers and the legacy we live as the church that Jesus Christ built and called us to be part of. You see, we live on when we go on to our eternal home. At least for a time, someone will remember us. I look back and I think about the people in my life who were most influ influential and some of them were great influences and some of them actually are some of you who I hope are listening today. But there have been other influences in my life who I had to overcome. They were wrong influences. And scriptures teach us again and again that we do things today that will matter tomorrow. And Paul talked about those things and about the foundation upon which we build. And I'd like to share that scripture with you today from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 
This is what Paul wrote. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Too often in this life, we try to be the foundation of things. We try to have the things that we believe that are important to us become the foundation for our families, for our friends, and the places where we work. But in truth, Paul is reminding us that God gave us the foundation when he sent his only son, Jesus, to come to us, God in the flesh, to save us, but also to teach us by his example. He sent his Holy Spirit at Pentecost, to a group of people, not one person alone, but to a group, so we would recognize that we are to do this building that we do in community. We don't build alone. God has always provided what we need. He provides what we need today, and he'll provide in the future, but the best thing he has, he has provided is for the foundation upon which we build. And the apostles did that. We read about the work they do. I just read to you words that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. He was an incredible church builder, but he wasn't always a good man. We remember Peter, Peter the afraid, you know, the guy who denied Jesus. And yet both of these men built upon the foundation that Jesus gave to us with courage and faith and perseverance what was wrong in their lives was left behind and they learned to speak of righteous things and they learned to speak boldly and we need to learn to speak boldly as well because when we speak boldly that is part of the legacy we leave behind. An example of this is found in Acts chapter 4. Peter, that guy who had denied Jesus, but who was forgiven by Jesus and restored? He had been working around the temple, and he had the audacity one day to heal man on the Sabbath. And it made the Sadducees and the leaders and the religious scholars angry. And they questioned him. And in Acts 4, we heard these words spoken by Peter the timid, who had become Peter the bold. This is what he said. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. The man you crucified but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures, where it says, The stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Now that was bold. That was leaving boldly, although Peter wouldn't leave for a while. He would leave by being martyred, by being crucified upside down. And he said these words to the very men who had called for Christ to be crucified. And that was courageous. Part of leaving boldly means standing and speaking with courage. Speaking in opposition to things that Jesus would oppose. Speaking for those who don't have a voice. 
And you might wonder, well, what role do I have in this? What's my place? People have been building upon the foundation of Jesus for 2,000 years. What's left for me to do? Well, once again, Peter speaks to us through his first letter. And this is what he says about who we are and what we should be. He says this in chapter 2 of 1 Peter. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. That's our role still, 2,000 years later. To be stones that are built into God's spiritual temple. It really isn't the brick and mortar that makes up this sanctuary where we are not gathered today. Yet we're still a community worshiping in the spiritual temple that God has made of all of us as we choose to be the building blocks. This is the legacy that we're called to leave behind and what we're called to build. Anything less than that isn't good enough. We are the living stones of the spiritual temple when we share the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel that Jesus came for everyone. We are the stones, the building blocks, when we make our communities better places to live through our acts of service. We are the building blocks when we welcome the stranger and we love the downtrodden because in those moments we are being like Jesus Christ, the foundation. And what we build will be tested. It's being tested right now. Worshiping virtually invites lots of people into worship who never worshiped with us before. And yet we want to be together. I know that. I want to be with you. But what we've built here as a community is being tested and proven strong by your faithfulness in continuing to join here on Sunday morning from your own homes. Every person's home has become the church. We are being tested and we are building. We are being tested by economic hard times. Will we share what we have with those who have become unemployed? We are being tested by the temptation to be angry or selfish or self-righteous in the face of trials and protests and things that some of us simply can't understand because of the lives, the shelter's lives that we've sometimes led. What we build will speak for itself. Our rhetoric will, be, will mean nothing at all if when people look at us, they don't see the love of God, the generous heart of Jesus Christ, the nurturing spirit that resides within us. We're called to build a community of God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And as we look around today, that ought to be our focus because when we look, when we watch the news, when we see what's happening in our world, a lot of what we see doesn't look very heavenly. The quality of our legacy will be judged by how our children continue to build the church. The quality of our legacy will be judged by whether people who see us and how we behave, not just inside these walls, but when we're out in the world, at work, at the grocery store, on the road, when they see how we behave, they conclude, that person has something I don't have. That person is peaceful and loving in the middle of all this chaos. I want to know what that person has. And when we tell them that it isn't what we have, it's who we have, and that who is Jesus Christ, when they come to know him as well, then our legacy will be evaluated by that standard. We'll also be judged by how we respond to the societal crises that we face. 
as if it wasn't enough having COVID-19 people dying, much of our societal life being shut down, people unemployed. If that wasn't enough in the last couple weeks, something else has been brought into just stark clarity for us. And that is, we are facing social upheaval because racism still exists in America. I'm going to ask you today, if you're tired of hearing about this, I'm going to ask you today from the bottom of my heart, please don't turn away. We have to have this conversation. If the church, with people who profess Jesus, can't make changes in this world in which we live, then no one can change the way we live. Because when we make changes, we do it in the name of Jesus. And we know that Jesus loved everyone. That Jesus called the little children to come to him. That Jesus told us that those who are persecuted, who mourn, who are peacemakers, are blessed. We have to address this subject. And it's hard to do because with this subject, biblical truth collides and blurs with so many things in ways that keep us uncomfortable. We blur the distinctions between the secular and the sacred, which makes people uncomfortable. How many times have we heard, don't talk politics? I'm not talking politics today, folks. I'm talking Jesus and Jesus' love for every human being. Jesus was critical of society. He was critical of the powerful people. He was critical of those in the temple courtyard when he drove out the money changers. And one of the reasons he was critical is because they were taking advantage of people who lived in poverty. You know, George Floyd's killing has raised an incredible outrage across the land. People who are outraged at the killing and people who are outraged at others who are outraged. And it appears that there's no way for us to win. But when we watch a man die a slow death on a video that speaks for itself, I don't know about you, but it kindled something in me that had never been kindled before, and for that, I am ashamed. Some reactions have been peaceful. Some have been violent. And I'm not here today to condemn anyone. I'm not here today to condemn anyone at all. Last Sunday, after I listened to Pastor Bob's message about humility... I summoned up a little humility of my own, and I went to Tampa to take part in a march. Now, let's face it. I'm someone who was a Girl Scout during Vietnam. I was in ROTC in college right after the Vietnam War ended. I am a rule follower. I mean, nobody follows rules like me. But last Sunday, I had to break the rules. I wasn't violent, didn't break any windows or bring any stones. But I walked with some brothers and sisters where I witnessed fear and anger and frustration. I did not see any violence. I also saw police officers along the route that we marched who were completely in control of themselves, some smiling gently at us, and I could only imagine that they were wishing in their hearts that there wasn't such a great divide between those who were walking by and they themselves. For the first time in my life, I understood what it felt like to wonder if those police saw me as the enemy. And so I shared that story of that march with our church staff on Tuesday, and I read a scripture from the book of Galatians, it says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. 
For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And after that, I asked the staff, does anyone have anything to say? And I never imagined what would follow. But our very own beloved Dr. Robert shared with us a little bit about what he's experienced in his life. And I've asked him to share that with us again this morning. Dr. Robert. Thank you, Pastor Pam. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Pastor Pam was saying in our staff meeting on Tuesday, uh, at a certain time during the meeting, uh, I expressed different things and my feelings uh, about recent events and racism and racial profiling in general. One of the problems we have in our society today, if not the worst one, uh, is the fact that some don't believe that racism and racial profiling actually exist. They are convinced, unfortunately, that there's no longer racism and that somehow we live in a post-racial society. That's not true. We have to accept the fact that while Jim Crow may be dead, his grandson, Jim Crow III, is alive and well. How do I know this? This is a situation that I've carried around my entire life as a black man in this country. We don't have a lot of time. I'll only give you a few examples. For instance, as it relates to racial profiling and racism, there's a reason why when I'm in a store, in the mall, when I walk in, immediately the undercover security is following me the whole time. Is that because I'm so well educated? Is that because I sing in church on Sunday morning? Is that because I went to Stillman College in Alabama? I don't think so. He doesn't know any of that about me. Is that because I have two beautiful little granddaughters? That's not why he's following me. He's following me simply because of the color of my skin. Now, while we might dismiss that as coincidence, it's not. Several years ago, when I first moved to the Tampa Bay area, a young lady who was cutting my hair at the time, my barber, before she became a professional barber and established several other businesses of her own, in a former life, her vocation was as a shoplifter, young African-American lady. She would team up with a friend of hers who was white. They would go to various stores as a pair, split up while security was following her. Her white partner would actually do the shoplifting because they knew that would work. And she expressed to me that it worked every time. This is not an isolated incident. Or maybe when I'm on an elevator on the way up or down, I'm the only one on the elevator. The elevator opens. Some people, as the door opens and they start to get on the elevator, notice that I'm on the elevator and back up. Refuse to get on the elevator with me. Is that because I'm a worship leader at St. Paul United Methodist Church? I don't think so. They don't know that. That is Jim Crow the third. All of these things I've had to learn to do from the time that I can remember, as far back as I can remember. This is life. It does exist. It is real. 
we have to learn to deal with it because it is a dangerous addiction. To recover from any addiction, drugs, alcohol, I don't care what it is, the first step that we have to learn is to admit that that is our problem. At that point, and at that point only, can we begin to deal with it. Otherwise, it just festers and will kill us. Perhaps on my morning walk, even prior to COVID-19, I'm on a sidewalk, walking one way, One particular uh, white lady on many different occasions coming the other way across the street. This happens all the time. This is not social distancing. This is a reality. That is Jim Crow the third. Recently, we heard a conservative journalist get into a tit for tat with a couple of athletes, professional athletes. I'll say their names, I won't say hers. LeBron James made what is considered a political statement about racism. Her response to him was, anybody making $100 million a year for playing basketball should not be making political statements. Keep your political statements to yourself. Shut up and dribble. Her actual words. Drew Brees, who you know, makes a political statement that she agrees with, and she lauds him. He should be able to speak. That's his right. He should be able to speak and say whatever he wants to. That's his opinion. Not one mention about his salary or shut up and throw the football. Because in her mind, Drew Brees is entitled to the salary he gets. LeBron James is not. That's Jim Crow the third. It does exist. We must deal with it. Uh, but we must deal with it the way Jesus would and the way he does. We must pray for the redemption of the souls of those who would have us downtrodden. Anytime a politician makes a reference to releasing vicious dogs on people, that's Jim Crow the third. My mind went straight to Bull Connor when I heard that. If you're having trouble remembering him, look him up. You'll see what I mean when I say if the devil ever had a right-hand man, it was Bull Connor. That's not who we want to be. So let us pray for the redemption of our country and for those who unfortunately have been mistaught and they have these attitudes. God bless you. I don't have much to add after that, um, just a little. This week, our bishop and cabinet of the Florida Conference of the United Methodist Church released a statement. I'm going to share just a little bit of it with you now. And this Wednesday, Reverend Dr. Candace Lewis will be Pastor Bob's guest on Wednesdays at 1. She can help us learn. I hope you'll tune in and listen. But these are a few of the words that our cabinet uh, sent out to the church in Florida. Their entire statement will be available on our webpage. And this is what they said in part. Racism is a sin and is blatantly incompatible with Christian teaching. As Jesus' people, we begin with the knowledge that all persons are created in the image of God. We believe all lives won't matter until we act as though black lives matter. Now that's a blockbuster statement to end the message with. 
I've heard the responses from so many people. Say, but Pastor Pam, blue lives matter. Yes, they do. And some of those blue lives that were snuffed out this week had black faces. What we need to understand is that God's design of this creation, this world, and people was for us to be stewards of the creation and to love. He created all of us in his image, but that image has become distorted by human sin. So for us today, I invite you to remember that Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are merciful. Blessed are those who recognize they're spiritually poor. Let us take this time to recognize difficult truths about the privilege we enjoy if we're white, about the beauty and value of our brothers and sisters who are not white, and let us remember that, yes, indeed, it was God who wants all lives to matter. But for that to be a truth in our world, lives that have been treated as less than have to matter to us as the people of the church. Let us pray. God, we are in a hard time right now. But we know that you can bring us through this time that you alone have the power to give us eyes that will see the world in a new way, to see other people in a new way. You will give us ears that can hear the cry of the needy, the vulnerable, the persecuted, and the drowned, downtrodden. That you alone can transform stubborn hearts and stiff necks. And so on this day, God, we offer up to you this church, whose legacy we will build as the people of St. Paul. And we ask today simply that you would teach us to be an instrument of your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning, number 138, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is. Let's sing verses 1 and 2. Receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you that you might become a blessing to a community that needs to be blessed both by God and by seeing God in you. And may God give you peace that you may become a peacemaker in a community that desperately needs peacemakers. As we leave this place together, I pray that God will bless you and keep you until we meet again. Amen and amen.